Okay, we're now live. Um, so welcome to um, the final uh, panel for 30 Days, 30 Ways UK. I'm joined by some lovely people today and I'll introduce you all in a minute. Um, just to sort of go over <clears throat> what the 30 Days, 30 Ways UK campaign is all about. It's about having um, giving people 30 ways to be a little bit better prepared by just having a simple thing to do each day. Um, now, we, what we've done is we've... Um, for people that can't um, join us every day to do this challenge, we've got a weekly theme. Um, so those weekly themes, um, we've got a panel at the end just to go over what we've talked about and um, and to look at um, and have expert on them panels that we can ask questions to. So um, if people did want to, who have joined us, want to ask any questions, please write that in the questions and I can bring that up or we can answer them via um, the answer uh, bit here as well. So uh, my name is Jo Adams. I've been with the campaign since the start in 2015. Um, this is the final one, as I've said, and this panel is all about um, having a prepared community. So I am joined uh, today by um, Richard Hood from Communities Prepared. Uh, Richard, welcome. Um, I'm also joined by Becky Maynard from the Voluntary Communities Emergency Partnership. Welcome, Becky. Thank you. Um, I'm also uh, joined by Jeannie Barr, who's uh, the chair of the Emergency Planning Society. Welcome back, Jeannie. I know you're on the first one. Um, seems, seems ages ago because the first one was on the 2nd of September, but we, are, we obviously paused when with the Queen's death. Um, and restarted it so it seems ages ago since I last saw you so welcome Jeannie and I'm also um, joined by Tara um, from Northern Ireland and uh, Joan from Northern Ireland as well welcome ladies again and you're on the first one as well thank you very much for joining us so uh, um to start this panel off, I'm going to ask one of the days, which is my favourite day of the whole campaign, is um, well, what is one of the favourites um, is about uh, disaster movies. So um, I just want to know what your favourite disaster movie is and and why. Um, so I'm going to come to you first, Jeannie, put you on the spot to come first. What's your favourite disaster movie? I've got actually when I was thinking about it. Every time I chose one, I thought, oh, no, I think I quite like the other one instead. So I have bought some of the big disaster movies. So things like The Core, like Armageddon, <laughs> things like Deep War, Horizon, all that. Basically because it was different types of disasters and also because it was across the war and it was different. And it was interesting to see how different countries deal with, with disasters in a different way. Um, don't Look Up was a classic because it reminded us all of the political situation at that time. Um, and that was quite exciting. And um, things like The Perfect Storm. And then I was thinking, what have those things got in common? And I suddenly realised that it, the leading men were probably quite nice looking. <laughs> that <laughs> so does help. <laughs> it was a common theme. And I wonder if, was it about the disaster management side of it or was it about the fact that the leading man was quite a nice chap? <laughs> Brilliant. I like that. It does, it does make a difference if you've got like a bad pit at the, at the helm. <laughs> um, uh, Joan, what, what's your favourite disaster movie? I have to agree with Jeannie here. It's always good to have a, a good uh, leading actor role. Uh, someone nice to look at but yes I think uh, Don't Look Up was uh, one that we've uh, seen recently and very um, contemporary and I suppose about uh, messaging and you know fake news and also about so many people having opinions and actually a trusted source of, of opinion mm -hmm. um, so I thought it was a really good one um, uh, I suppose from a Northern Ireland perspective we I, I can't really miss was Titanic um, because we we always say in Belfast uh, it was okay when it left here, <laughs> so, <laughs> so Titanic and again I suppose back to that leading actor role with uh, with Leo, um, but there has been so many good ones and I think it's a uh, it's a useful sometimes uh, useful to look at, at s some of those films and see how from the other side um, how we how people responded, um, certainly the the Netflix um, Chern Chernobyl and uh, the Salisbury. Um, uh, fellow or documentaries or um, uh, uh, programs were really really good and very useful learning as well 
Yeah, they're, they're definitely going, <clears throat> they're hitting home more, aren't they? It could be more factual. Yes. Um, uh, Becky, what, what's your favourite disaster movie? It's an interesting question. Um, <laughs> I'm not a fan of disaster movies and actually never have been. However, um, uh, there's a film called The Impossible, um, which was about the Asian tsunami of 2000. <gasps> yes. Um, which I read. Yeah profoundly moving um, and it was actually the tsunami that actually motivated me to join international humanitarian response um, but then having spent the last 10 or 12 years sitting in disaster zones um, following tsunamis and earthquakes and things like that it's probably not not my favorite genre of film um, but having said that you know the impossible actually does finish with that hope that we all need to feel because if we don't have that hope how are we going to get you know, what's the point of us trying what's the point of getting through and I think that that's why I particularly like that one because you know we've got to look to the you know what, it's been terrible but what can we do next yeah that's yeah uh, such a good film such a moving film yeah um Tara what's your favorite um I I very similar to Becky I had actually chosen the impossible as well you know the the love that families have, their quest for survival, for keeping together, even in, you know, disastrous times. So similar to that, um, I had also thought about a film that I watched when I very soon after I joined Emergency Planning or the World of Emergency Planning, which was Greenland. It was a film with Jared Butler in it, who is also quite nice to look at. And, um, you know, again, the, the when disaster is hit, how people react, how, how they will um, pull together and, and move move heaven and earth to 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 help um to keep together and stay together um so yes uh the, the impossible was one of these films that sort of showed the real chaos that ensued after the tsunami and and, and enjoyed both those type of, of of movies um also one that i i watched recently was uh 13 lives it was a, a rescue movie a, a real life um non-fiction sort of one which um i would recommend as well mm, yeah <clears throat> very good and and richard sorry you've got the the short straw <laughs> um what's your favorite no, that's fine. I don't mind going last. Uh, well, m my interest is not around the leading men, so so I'm a bit different <laughs> on this panel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, so me, I, I really like the the, the rescue movies, uh, the rescue side of it, rather than the disaster side. But both have to come in hand in hand, unfortunately. Uh, going off with what, what Tara was saying, I really enjoyed the the, the, the thir thirteen lives, and there's two other films as well which go with that. Uh, which go in a sort of a set, but look at it from different angles. You've got The Cave, and it's also The Rescue, and it's just different people's slight different takes on it. So those are a real good uh, good watch around that. Uh, there's another one called The 33, which is based on the Chilean miners who were, who were trapped underground, uh, which is another, another good film. And then I suppose my favourite two would, well, my favourite three, sorry, <laughs> well, everybody's got loads, haven't <laughs> we? Uh, is Only the Brave, which is about the hot shots in America, which is the wildfire fighters. And it was a, a special uh, local group. And it was almost like a, a community group that came together and pr produced uh, a, a team of, of firefighters. Unfortunately, uh, it, it's... We're not going to spoil the ending, but it it, it wasn't a, a, it wasn't the, the the upbeat ending that you might want, but it was a real life based story. The other one is Finest Hour, which is U.S. Coast Guard uh, that go out in 1952 for an oil tanker uh, that that there was a, a split in a in a in a storm, and that's a very human story, very challenging. Uh, going up against the odd sort of thing. And the other one is a bit more of a an action-packed uh, one, which is The, the Guardian. Uh, so Kevin Costner in that one. Uh, but uh, it's the, the US Coast Guard helicopters, and that was filmed after like Katrina. And the idea was to talk about how they, th they operate and go out when others don't, so to speak. So, yeah, those are mine. Lovely. Cool. There's some good films there. So hopefully um, give people some um, some good starters for 10. And I know the Immense Planning Society you have a um, a movie night, don't you? So if, if you want to sort of join on that, uh, look on Twitter. <laughs> um, OK, so um, 
this week's theme is all about prepared communities. So we're joined by um, communities prepared and uh, voluntary uh, communities uh, sector emergency partnership. So uh, Richard, I want to come to you first. Um, what does communities prepared do in and how can you sort of get communities to, together to to, um, to to make this happen? Well, well, communities prepared is, is it came out of the the, the the flooding in the southwest so in in, uh, in 2015-14 and we would very strongly uh recognize the need for communities to come together and face uh the, the challenges that, that that they were and so what community so what we do is we we work with communities recognizing their individuality and they're made up of individual people, individual skills, individual capacities, and also individual challenges. So there's no one size fits all solution. And so we recognize that a community needs to come up their own way forward. And so we're trying to help them with uh, skills training and, rec and, empower and, and self empowerment, so to speak, recognize they're empowered already. But Going more specifically, looking at some of the things we've covered, like flooding and things like that, we talk about personal uh, personal resilience, being prepared for uh, and being aware of the hazards that, that you may face in your local area. So, uh, you know, if, if, if you know you're at a risk of flooding, being aware of the flood risk, being aware of signing up for flood alerts, knowing those sorts of things, uh, making adaptions to your property, having a plan in place at a personal level, but also at a community level. Uh, so it's helping your neighbours, so help yourself and help your neighbours sort of thing. Having a grab bag in place so you can uh, have your essentials like uh, banks, bank cards, uh, you've got so a grab bag with that in, any medicines, prescriptions, uh, any any valuable uh, anything that's particularly valuable or sentimental and uh, making sure you put that into a safe location uh, documents that are important like driving licenses and things like that and just being ready to get out at a moment's notice but the biggest thing I would say is monitoring uh, and so the more you monitor the more you're aware of what's going on the more time you have to allow you to act so you can actually do more in that time so it all comes back to individual preparedness. So, yes. That's brilliant. And I know every, a lot of what you've said there is just recapping the whole of this campaign. You know, sign up for flood, water, uh, flood warnings, get make a, make, get a kit, make a plan. Um, so that's, uh, that's thank you. It's like I've, um, I've prompted you to say all of that. <laughs> but that's brilliant. <laughs> thank you very much, Richard. So um, is it... Um, what, how many communities have do you work with over the, around the UK? So, so we work. Uh, the national lottery funding that we've got is predominant for England wide. However, we we do work with other communities around the UK. Uh, certainly, now we are we are, we've expanded our online website. We, we've now got an online learning portal. So anybody is able to sign up free of charge as membership. Once you're a member, you can then access that training 24-7, 365 days a year. And so you can actually engage with that training, get that base knowledge. And then you can actually come to online workshops, forums and webinars where it takes that knowledge that you've gained and says, right, well, how can you apply that to your local area? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's having that base knowledge and then saying, what can you do? What do you want to do? Mm. You know, uh, what is your capabilities? Yeah. So, so yes. The, the so if people wanted to find that, if they just put communities prepared into Google, would they? Would yes. They well, the up? website is www.communitiesprepared.org.uk. So it's, oh, it's, simple. it's not that yeah. hard to find. Brilliant. <laughs> That's great. Well, thank you. Cool. Okay. Now that, that sounds really good and that sounds really positive around, um, around, England uh what you're working with working with communities and bringing them together um I know uh you know when I've worked with communities the first thing is you know what risks you do you have in your own area some live by you know um uh, main river main road so yeah that's that's really good um I want to come on to you now Becky um can can you sort of tell us a bit about what what um what you've been doing what your what your organization's all about 
Sure, thanks, Jan. Um, so for those of you who haven't come across the um, uh, Emergencies Partnership, uh, we're effectively a network of networks. Um, so we were really founded after the Grenfell Tower fire and the Manchester Arena bombings, where there was recognition that the voluntary sector weren't necessarily working as cohesively as, as would benefit society the most. Uh, and so we are you know, now a, a group co-chaired by um, NAVCA and the, and the Red Cross, uh, but we now have members of every shape and size. So from emergency response specialists um, to local infrastructure organisations, so we've got you know the the reach across the country yet you know, hopefully from national regional local and even hyper local um, our main aim really is to bring those organizations together and to support you know better joint working and shared learning most importantly in the response recovery and prepare, preparedness phases of a disaster cycle um, you know so, so really we sort of that preparedness that Richard was talking about is absolutely key to rapid recovery um, you know so we try and provide and facilitate um, you know ways in which people can can learn and share so I mean our main products so we share a lot of insights uh, and work work on sort of building capabilities, uh, knowledge, and also just bringing people together, um, you know, who might not otherwise meet each other or know each other. Um, we use a whole heap of different tools. So we use um, a tool called Slack, um, which I don't know if, if people use it, but it's kind of like a a grown up version of WhatsApp, I would say, um, but it gives us the opportunity to, to share information either regionally or nationally. So for example, we can share, um, and I'm sure we will have shared the community's prepared training, uh, but also all the different 30 days, 30 ways, um, uh, things that, that, have, that have come up. We then have, we have regular bulletins, we have network calls that everybody's invited to, and we have you know, specific topics that we address. Uh, we have capability events where we sort of look at different areas that would help people you know, gain better insight and knowledge. Um, these events, I should say, are not generally for the general public, uh, but more for the voluntary and community sector, plus the statutory bodies that we work with. Um, you really, we are, we have a small team at the centre who are facilitators more than anything else. So we're very reliant on our partners, um, you know, to actually provide the learning we will then share and encourage and direct people to. Uh, and I think, you know, this is a, a fantastic example of it. So, I mean, societal resilience and cost of living are topics that are just high on every conversation and agenda that we're having across the voluntary sector at the moment. And they've certainly shaped our recent discussions. And one of the biggest pieces of feedback that we've had is that, you know, those two things, cost of living and societal resilience are such massive concepts that, you know, how do you even start? Where do you begin to start breaking that down? Um, and so the idea of having these bite-sized chunks has really resonated with our audiences. Um, you know, we're now sort of looking at winter pressures and different discussions, but by being able to just say, look, you're not going to solve everything at once. You know, what we can do is make sure that <clears throat> where we find good practice, we share it and we don't try and solve the entire puzzle. You know, what we need to do is just look at it piece by piece. So you know, in the last um, meeting we had uh, on, on winter pressures recently, actually, you know, we had that discussion and said, look, we're not going to do this. Let's look at 30 ways, 30 days. Sorry, the wrong way around, 30 days, 30 ways, you know, and take that as an example. Let's have a theme each month that we try and address, you know, and actually just start you know, looking at the risk registers and say, you know, what's our top priority and how do we then sort of move down that list? Uh, and that way we are making sure that we're doing as much as we can and sharing as widely as we can. Because I think it's easy to look at a large, you know, huge organisation with lots of funding behind it who have staff that they can dedicate to looking at these things. Whereas actually, if you're a local infrastructure organisation, you might have one full-time and one part-time staff member. So how on earth can they you know, to try and tackle something like this? So you know, we, we're absolute massive fans of, um, you know, of this concept and project. And it's, you know, I think it's a huge help to, to all our members. Thank you, Becky. And I know, <clears throat> um, I know uh, tomorrow all is all about volunteering. And I know um, from from my local area, um, over COVID, we had something like forty four thousand individuals volunteer for us to help out um, around um, my county. Um, but it's trying to keep hold of those. I know we've we've tried to um, get them to sort of sign up to sort of regular volunteer. Um, but do you see anything, do you see people still volunteering? Because I know people are so tired uh, since COVID. And I know because we were using them again and again, you know, month out, month in. Um, do people still volunteer? I know, you know, tomorrow's all about volunteering. We want to try and get people to volunteer, whether they individually volunteer for, I don't know, search and rescue or Red Cross or individually for, uh, you know, for yourselves. Um, do you see that, you know, UK wide, is it a, um, something that it's a, a national thing 
So, I mean, it, it's difficult because I think, um, you know, during COVID, we had, you know, huge upsurge in numbers of volunteers putting their hands up. We also had a huge number of volunteers you know, who were needed. Um, mm. However, you know, we've got all kinds, so some of those volunteers weren't used and therefore they've sort of slightly lost faith and thought, mm, OK, well, if you don't want me, mm. then I'm not anymore. You've got a lot of people who were on furlough um, and therefore they've gone back to their full time job and may not have the capacity anymore to volunteer but you know i would say we have seen um retention of you know the the level of volunteers that we had pre-covid uh you know and i think when there is a, a real crisis people do tend to step up which is really important yeah i think one of the challenges coming up um you know, will be cost of living um yeah and for example fuel prices so a lot of um you know smaller organizations can't afford necessarily to pay expenses at wonderful rates um but a lot of people can't afford then to drive long distances to go and volunteer so I can see that there are areas like that that you know, could potentially be real hurdles um, to volunteerism as well. But I have, I don't know, I, I, I'm an optimist and I have huge faith in the, in the public. And uh, you know, so far in my experience, I've never seen a crisis where people haven't stepped up when they, when they know that their neighbours or their friends need that level of support. Yeah, well, well said. Yeah, no, I agree with that. Um, OK, um, now I'm going to open it to the rest of the, the panellists now. Um, just to sort of have a bit of a recap over the last month or two months <laughs> um, what, and we can have a, a free for all. I mean, what's, uh, what's the campaign uh, meant to you and what, uh, you know, what, what, what things stuck in your mind over the last 30 days um, as, um, as good practice? And uh, I'll go first here, um, Joanna, if you yeah, have yeah. enough. Um, so I suppose from a Northern Ireland perspective, we do things a little bit differently as only Northern Ireland can do. Um, so we we haven't done the everyday um, messages. We've just pick, uh, chosen uh, several messages that we feel that our organisations, I suppose, are, are well enough um have the capacity to uh, to issue and cascade. So I think in um, and Tara has been instrumental in pulling us together across all the different agencies that we work with. But we and because of the the, the change and the, the pause um, in September, we have selected eight days uh, for the during October, and all went very well. And uh, we used uh, the power cuts, uh, ready home, be bright, be seen. Ready Kids, uh, the um, ho Ready Home Check, Respecting the Water, and, and of course then with the, the final one for thank you at the weekend, I suppose the one I just really want to, to, to pause at was the, the grab bag and the household preparedness piece, mm -hmm. which is 20th of October. And uh, we got uh, a lot of, uh, well, we got a lot of feedback, um, a lot of it negative um, with regards to the grab bag piece. Um, and I suppose just thinking about the, what was going on in the background in that day with the, the Prime Minister resigning and also just with their own political background here in Northern Ireland, um, it did cause a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, well, negative in one respect, but also I think it, also it did shine a light on, you know, personal resilience and the need for personal resilience mm -hmm. and also making sure that we weren't being alarmist, but also being proportionate about our responses. So I think it's something that was, it was a useful conversation to have. Um, I suppose we have to reflect on uh, the, the use of social media and some voices being louder than others and having um, to be able to, not, not to retract, but be able to respond in a measured way. Um, so that was a very useful learning piece. And I think thinking about what where we're going in Northern Ireland and producing our first community risk register. Mm -hmm. I think that's very good learning for ourselves on a multi-agency basis as well in relation to uh, personal resilience, but also a communication strategy. So um, we are really only dipping our toes in this at the moment. So uh, that, that was useful, but no, really, really good. And a lot of, um, a lot of uh, buy-in and commitment from all our organizations. So uh we've um, issued out the survey and it'll be interesting to see what the, the, the feedback will be um so uh, maybe tara wants to add something on because i said tara is very much involved and i've done very much a real champion to get uh, organizations involved here in northern ireland so i'll just pass all my thanks uh, to tara as well thank, thank you. you got anything to add tara <laughs> well um, thank you joan um no just just to back up what joan had said we we <coughs> covered over the over the whole campaign we covered 12 days and the 20th of october was was an exciting one for us but 
after we sat back and reflected on it, we did get quite a lot of pragmatic and practical reaction from the public. Um, you know, they talked about um, preparedness for domestic violence. You know, they talked about volunteering and, and the grab bag it helped bring that conversation mm. forward. So without it, um, maybe we wouldn't have, got, have, have had the same response in Northern Ireland. So, um, I, you know, good good and good and uh, good and bad but mostly good um in in the campaign so thank you that's, that's great and they, <clears throat> back in uh, 2019 we had the same thing with the grab bag um over here um and it blew out blew up um out of uh, huge um i think i think it was trending for a bit <clears throat> but again i think even with the negative views i think it raises the awareness and then when you actually say it's not just today it's the whole campaign you know we discussed you know we started off with what risks there are this is only a one part of it we're not you know so um it's um it, it, i suppose it brings it to the forefront doesn't it and we just need to keep building on it I, th I think it was also the pause and the restart. People had sort of got out of the way of it mm -hmm. and, and weren't really expecting it, maybe. And it, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it was, yeah. And it and that, but that was unavoidable. So yeah. No, that's that's all good. Um, Jeannie, from your perspective, then I think um the grab bag has always been a bit of a contentious subject, as you said. Um, but it does generate a huge amount of discussion. And as far as we are aware, you know, it allows people to become prepared because if you're discussing it, then you're gaining learning and knowledge from it. As long as we don't actually encourage trolls or anything like that, if the subject's being discussed, it's a positive, whether that is a, a positive or a negative. And even for myself looking at the different lists and suggestions as far as what you would put in the grab bag, it was a, a reminder and a prompt. Oh my goodness, I never thought of that. Mm. And it's about looking at, this is about community preparedness. So it's, so it's about empowering them to be, do something for themselves. So in, in the events of something happened, they are prepared. That's not just prepared as far as what they have in their grab bag. The grab bag is not just the bag of stuff. It's it's actually mm -hmm. that the consequences of whatever happens is to a certain degree yeah. limited. So you know all the campaigns, even the information about you know think about children and the children's safety side of things. Think about your pets when you're actually going away on holiday, do you know all the emergency services numbers? It's not always 112 or 911 or 999. You need to look at all the different, you know, who do you contact within the different, and it allows people to open up that thinking process and that in turn helps them to be prepared. So even if it does, you know, attract some negative comments or whatever, when the discussions go on, it's all about learning from other people whether it's um so there's some really key moments within it and certainly feedback from members was about the specifics like the grab bag like the pets like the travel like the children like all the other tools that perhaps people wouldn't normally think about but they are now thinking about it and talking about it now yeah definitely and and uh, the hot the the there's been so many um fire services, police services, um, local authorities, um, voluntary commu community organisations that have supported this 30 days this year. Um, obviously, I can't name all of them. Um, and there's been over a few hundred of them, which has been absolutely brilliant. So we can't, we have to say a big thank you to all of those, um, our partners that have been actually um, sharing best practice from around the UK, from um you know what they've been doing locally um some big organizations such as the met office the rnli um the ea that have actually been supporting this this year's campaign as well so you know thank you to all of those um and you know it's been fantastic and there's been some great days there's been some good discussion over the over the last month people can catch up on all of that uh, on twitter go to our website and you can actually see the sort of twitter threads um a link there that you can actually catch up on um these um panels um we've had uh, this is our um fifth one so we had a quick introduction we had the understanding risk 
uh, where we bring partners together. So that's the first thing. And I know uh, Richard, you mentioned we need to know what the risks are. Um, we 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 tapped into community risk registers and national risk registers. Um, then once we understood all the risks that are there, and going from the community uh, national risk register, we discussed you know sort of flooding, um, you know a uh, fire. Uh, we then said make a plan. So we had the, the theme was make a plan. We then had preparation checks, you know, checking your home, checking your car. Um, that was quite good day. And we had um, uh, Highways England involved in that as well. Um, to this day, sort of prepare community. So we all sort of just, this is all sort of pushed all together. Um, um, somebody mentioned the survey. I think it was Tara. There is a, a survey for the UK to fill in. We've been running it for the last four years, um, and uh, it's just trying to sort of gauge. You know, are people getting? Uh, you know, taking this on board? Are they? Do they know a little bit more? Um, so the questions have always been the same, and it, the, the um, that will go into our final report um, to see what that is. So please carry on uh, sharing the survey. It will be open until the end of this month at the end of November, should I say, um, and um, we'll, we'll um, do the final report uh, for this year's campaign um, sort of later on in the year. Um, I don't think there's any questions, um, but I just want to say, um, as we're coming up to a sort of overtime, um, thank you very much to the this, uh, today's panellists. Thank you very much for joining us and thank thanking all the other panellists that have joined um, over the last month. Um, uh, has anybody got anything, any last things that you want to say before we close? No, that's. I suppose brilliant. just maybe, Joanne, yeah. just to thank yourself um, as well, because it's, I know yeah. it's it was a hard one this year with the pause, um, and just to get that reinvigorated and also just uh, to keep that continuity. So just to thank yourself as well. Yeah, thank you. And I know um, this year we've had a few other organisations um, come to us to sort of say we want to have a day next year. So uh, we'll be, uh, myself and Monica, we'll be looking at that early on next year to sort of put the program together so I sort of build it together for next year so thank you very much and as this month draws to a close um yeah we'll uh, we'll see you all again next year thank you ever so much and um take care thank see you soon you. Thank, thank you, you. Take care. Bye. Thank, thank you, you. Bye.